Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining me here on the first episode of the I Am Barabbas podcast. Now, there is an episode zero, and if you're watching this on YouTube or you're on the website or you're checking out the podcast on Google Podcasts or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you will see that. Uh, the first episode or episode zero is titled A Woman in a Robe, and in that podcast, I had made mention of the fact that uh, episode one is where I explain uh, where I came up with the idea for the website and, and coming up with these podcast uh, ideas and, and just putting out this content. And so, well, here it is. Uh, a few months back, sometime last year, I had a student call me and he had some questions about some stuff I had taught in a class. And uh, it took me a few seconds to remember what it was that he needed the information about. Uh, but once I got my mind churning uh, and he you know, gave me the necessary uh, parameters uh, for the class that he was thinking about and and you know, just the content that he was he was remembering I was able to you know spit out the information he needed and then he said man you've you've got to write this stuff down I said yeah yeah I know I know and the reality is that I've had students tell me that for years I've been uh, teaching for nine years at Trinity International University uh, in the undergrad psych program and you know our job, is is unique in that we have to not only teach a psychology, but we've got to integrate that that material, that secular material, like material about you know Sigmund Freud or Alfred Adler or Gordon Alport or whoever it might be, with a biblical perspective, and and not just Bible. We've got to integrate it with counseling as well. You know, psychology isn't always geared towards counseling. It's more about the science of the mind. And you got to figure out how to use that information for counseling, right? And then when you go to the Bible, it's not geared towards counseling either. Bible usually is geared towards theology, or at least that's how people usually express Bible. Uh, that's usually how your pastors teach it to you, right? And you're at church on Sundays, they usually present to you uh, biblical passages and they go through those passages trying to explain to you uh, ideas from the Bible and trying to teach you uh, theology or the study of God. Right? And they, they try to teach you, you know, Christology, the study of Christ, or what does it mean uh, to be saved, right? Or what does it mean that Jesus died on the cross? And what does it mean that he was buried? And what does it mean that he rose again? Or, you know, I'm sticking with the same kind of theme. Or what does it mean to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Or what is sanctification? Uh, those kinds of things. And and so we have to then take that content, which is from the Bible, and try to find a way to look at it from a counselor's perspective. And that also has to be done with psychology. And there are books out there from, from both fields, right, that, that help us do that. But a lot of times as professors, uh, through leading of the Holy Spirit and through experience, we end up coming up with our own insights, our own material that help us explain to our students how the two can fit together, how psychology and how the scriptures really can can fit together and help us understand human beings, help us understand you know what goes wrong with human beings or at least what causes pain in human beings and the struggles that human beings go through. And and so uh, when we're teaching, we share those insights with our students and and so over the years I've had students say, hey, professor, have you written those things down or have you written a book or whatever? And it's flattering to hear those things. But, you know, I grew up in a, a tradition of Christianity where, you know, you just don't take on those kinds of compliments. You're just like, ah, don't worry about it. You know, you can write that stuff down. It's 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 hard to take on compliments and not just the tr tradition of the 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 denomination, but also in the culture, I feel like in Indian culture, or at least in my family, it was always hard for us to take on compliments, right? So I always, I even joked around and would tell my students, you write it down, you write the book and, you know, write a, an acknowledgement for me if you want. Uh, but after this last interaction that I had with a student, it wasn't the last interaction, but a, an interaction with I had a student um, over the phone uh, sometime in 2020, uh, I heard the Lord speak to me and make it clear that, you know what, I, I should take it more seriously, that I should start to write down some of the stuff that I have been teaching over the years and start sharing it 
with just the general public because my classroom is my classroom and I've always taken the time to teach my students and connect with my students on a very deep level and share with them the insights I've had. Uh, but I heard the Lord speak to me and be very clear about his desire for me to start pouring out what he has poured out into me into a wider audience. And so I thought, okay, I'll start writing some of this stuff down. I started writing some of this down. And then um, I realized, you know what? Not all of my students like to read. Uh, not all, a lot of, and not, so not everybody out there wants to read the articles that I'm writing. And, you know, I, I've been posting the articles on social media and just trying to share uh, the stuff out there. And I can see, right, that I get a certain amount of views and that's awesome but nowhere near like the amount of people that actually follow me on social media. And some of that is because, oh, people are just aren't interested. But some of that is also because some people, they click on an article that might be an eight to 10 minute read. They just don't want to read it. Uh, I get students who have to read, you know, a hundred pages a week and they're getting a degree if, you know, they do their work well and they still don't want to read their work, right? Some people just aren't meant for to be voracious readers or even casual readers. And I understand that. I get that. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll start recording some of these thoughts as well, because some people uh, learn better that way, or they're not going to take the time to read so they can listen to me speak and that'll work. Right. And then I was like, well, man, some people can listen, but others need to watch. So some people need to see, they, they need to, they need to have a more of a visual experience as well. So I was like, all right, you know what? I'll go ahead and record this on camera. And so that's why there are three ways that you can engage with the material that I'm creating. And you can see that I'm creating all of this content uh, and I'm, I'm not charging anything. I'm not requiring anything. Um, it's on YouTube and I, I doubt we're ever going to get to the point where there's so many people watching where they're going to have ads popping up on it. So, you know, I'm not worried about that. Uh, but if you want to watch it there, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, you can, and you can follow the links through flyothoughts.com and, uh, you, or you can watch it directly on the website. Uh, and if watching is, isn't an option for you, uh, then you can listen to it. If that's something that you want to do while you're driving, like I said, whatever, and you're interested in the material. Uh, and again, this is like a mostly just integration of psychology and Bible and counseling, right? Just the ideas that I get from there and how it helps, I think, us as believers, those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to kind of form various concepts in our heads that go beyond just theology and the Bible. Because sometimes there's a disconnect there. And I, I know because I first went through theology, I was almost done with my degree in, in biblical and Bible theology and exposition, but I decided not to continue at the school I was at because of just the inordinate amount of racism I endured while I was there. Uh, and I didn't want to go back to the school. You know, I was gone for the summer and the thought of going back there was just overwhelming. And I was 12 credits away from finishing that. And I said, I don't want to go back. And I decided to enroll at Trinity. And when I went there and talked to the advisors and they said, well, if you go into Christian ministry, which is the only degree they had that was related to Bible, uh, it was going to take me like a, another two years to finish the degree because, you know, not all tr uh, credits transfer. And then I said, no, that's too long, right? I've already been in school for so long and I, I only had 12 credits left at this other school. And they offered psychology to finish like in uh, um, 18 months instead of 24 months. And I said, you know what, I'll, I'll do that. And that's kind of how I fell into it. But going from theology into counseling, but still having a, a Christian perspective in, in both areas, right, um, helped me understand people better. And so that's why I think this material will be interesting to some of you. And so if you want to listen to it, like I said, you can download on, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcast, And all the links you can get to through my website, filethoughts.com. Or the podcast is just called I Am Barabbas Podcast. I Am Barabbas Podcast. Okay. Now, the subject for this specific, well, that's how, by the way, that's just a summary. That's how I got to doing all of this. And again, I don't want 
anything from it other than people to, you know, learn. And ultimately, I want people to heal. And I, that's really what I think of what we have to offer for uh, believers. And what I mean, we is, is those of us who have uh, put ourselves into this place of education in psychology and counseling and the Bible. Uh, we have learned what it means to actually heal from the things that hurt us in this world. And I was, you know, I did a podcast for the Big Brown Army. We talked about mental health in that podcast. And you may have heard that already because a lot of people uh, check that out. I shared that on, out on my social media links. And so you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback on that. You've heard me talk about that already. And I've already had people reach out to me. And actually, you know, call me and we've had discussions uh, about that podcast or subjects related to that podcast. And, you know, there there is real healing that can be had, uh, emotional healing and spiritual healing and, and physical healing is there as well. And mental healing uh, that can happen once you have kind of a perspective that goes into the scriptures that's different from the theology that is constantly taught to you on Sundays at church. Not that that, and, and that theology is not bad, it's not wrong, but you'll notice for yourself that you go and you listen and you hear the same messages over and over, and you've heard the Bible stories and you've heard the people share the same perspectives, but there's something missing. And that something missing is just that perspective that's needed about what really hurts in the human soul, in the human psyche. And so that's what, again, I want to offer out there for free. And I think, and my, my hope and my prayer is that by offering this platform and by offering the information through this platform, that people would, would hear this information and either just by listening, that something would be unlocked inside of them, that God would pour into you and that you would find the healing that you've been looking for, or you would contact me and we would talk more. And even if you've got questions or if you've got disagreements, that we would struggle, that you would wrestle with, with something I've said or wrestle with me or wrestle with God, whatever it might be. Um, or at the or I would hope that you would, you know, seek out a counselor or seek out a therapist or seek someone to go talk to uh, so that you can, you know, pursue avenues uh, for healing because it's I they are out there. There's no reason why you should live in this world struggling with depression or anxiety. Uh, or any number of um, of conditions that, are ex that exist out there uh, that Christians have been told you just either have to confess to God and deal with because of your sin, or you just you struggle with until you die and go to heaven, or whatever it might be. No, there is real healing that God wants to provide because through your healing, uh, He then is enabled and and active and ready to go out into the world and and do greater things, right? And so. Uh, that's pictured for us in the gospel. So anyway, uh, that's my hope and prayer uh, through through this ministry and through this podcast. Now, I want to get into the subject of this podcast, and it's related to uh, two articles that I've already posted on the website. So if you haven't read it, and I know and you haven't read it uh, just because you didn't, aren't aware, um, the the two articles, uh, one the first one is called uh, a Jesus Son of Abba. And the second one is called Cognitive Dissonance, or I should say it's called A Look at How Cognitive Dissonance Can Impact Christian Identity. So these two articles were posted back in May, right? So I know it's it's the end of June. I had a, you know, a, a few things happen. I traveled unexpectedly and just other things were going on in my life. I, so I'm a little behind on the podcast um, aspect of, of the website. So forgive me for that. But uh, these two articles have been posted out there for a while, so you can go back and read them for context later, right? If you're listening or watching this now, uh, and and if I'm going fast, you you want to go back and you want to have something to read and look at. Uh, um, and again, you can you can follow me on social media, and you can get to my social media links through my website, and that's thylethoughts.com. Uh, thyle is spelled T-H-A-Y-I-L thoughts.com. So. The, the first article I'm referencing is Jesus, Son of Abba. And in this article, I take a look at Jesus' Jesus's experience in front of the crowd that decides to uh, put him on the cross. And if you 
are familiar with the Bible, uh, then you and, and the gospel stories in the New Testament, then you're most likely familiar with this exchange because it's one that you probably hear growing up in the church, or at least you hear around Easter, uh, because it was the moment where, you know, it's a, a pivotal moment where it seems like there's a chance that maybe Jesus won't be crucified, and yet the crowd chants, crucify him, crucify him, and so he ends up going to the cross. And the passage I specifically look at is in Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27, verse 15 through 25. And in that passage, uh, you have um, a certain group of actors, uh, or, you know, I'm, I'm just, if you're setting a scene, right? I believe all of this to be historical and real, and so don't freak out. I know there's some people who get really worried about some of the language sometimes, like, oh, the Bible's real and all this stuff. Okay, uh, there, but I'm just trying to paint a picture here. Okay, so you've got certain actors. You've got uh, you've got Jesus, you've got Pilate, and you've got Barabbas, and you've got a crowd. Um, and then kind of behind the scenes, uh, in the crowd, mixed in the crowd, you've got the religious leaders of the time. And then you've got one more um, player on this scene, and that's God himself, God the Father. Uh, and I remember growing up, uh, people would say, that if they were there at that scene, they would be in the crowd ch chanting, crucify him, crucify him, right? So they identified with that crowd. Uh, and one of the things that I bring up a lot in my classes is the importance of knowing who you are for mental health. It's really, really important to understand identity. Uh, when I would go into the juvenile detention center in Miami Dade, or I was working at the at Thompson Academy, which is a level six um, a, a offenders program by the state of Florida. It was up in Broward, which had, you know shut down a while ago. But I was interning there while I was a, a student. Uh, one of the things that I recognized a lot with those with those young men, right, and those are those are young men who are from the ages of twelve to seventeen who were incarcerated because of various crimes, anything from, from truancy, right, from skipping school and not being in school when they're supposed to be, to trespassing, to robbery, uh, to even murder. And, and you know what I would really notice a lot was how a lot of them struggled with knowing exactly who they were supposed to be in society. They just didn't know how they fit in. And the reason why I noticed that with them is because I had that struggle when I was a teenager, right? And that's kind of how it works with, with psychology is that people recognize things that were problems for them and then they go on and they start studying those things and they realize that that problem wasn't just their own, it's a problem that's very common for most human beings. That's how it worked with people like Freud, that's how it worked with someone like Adler, uh, that's how it worked with you know, other figures throughout throughout the realm of psychology. There's a very famous uh, existentialist, uh, Viktor Frankl, who had this perspective after coming out of the Holocaust so uh, that he gained after what he experienced and then he kind of created something after after what he experienced that, it, that lent to the existential movement. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard in the existential movement developed stuff from out of his own experiences and his look at scripture. So that's, you know, kind of how things work. And so I struggled with identity and, and, and uh, I touch on that in my second article that I'm referencing in this podcast. The, uh, it's titled, A Look at How Cognitive Dissonance Can Impact Christian Identity. Uh, because when I was a teenager, I really struggled with the idea of like who I am. Uh, and if you listen to the podcast uh, that was done with the Big Brown Army, uh, I kind of touched on this because we talked a lot about what it meant to be um, Mali uh, Malayali who was growing up in, so, uh, in, in, in the U.S. And we talked about a lot of different things and talked about how I struggled with my identity. Uh, but one of the things that really messed me up that I didn't touch on in that podcast, but I thought about it later, was when I was uh, younger, and I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I remember I was, I was, I was, I was young. I must have been you know, less than 10. Uh, maybe eight or seven, eight, nine years old. I remember my 
I was at my uh, an uncle's house and I was with my cousin, his his son, which is who's like a, a year older than me uh, and or like six months older than me. And they were cutting open a jackfruit on the kitchen counter. And uh, we call it chukka. So they're opening up chukka on the kitchen counter. And my cousin said to me, he was he was sitting on the counter and he was just like super excited that his dad was opening this up. And he's just like, oh, Reggie, you're going to have some chukka. And I, I just, I was just looking at it. I had never seen one before. And so he looked at his dad. He's like, oh, how does Reggie not know what, what chukka is, dad? And his dad said, that's because he's not a real Malayali. And that memory, uh, I remember at that moment feeling like, oh, okay. And when you're, when you're young, and again, I could have been younger. I could have been six. I don't know. When you're that little, I just you can't really tell how old you are. But that was one of those moments where um, it, it really did form my sense of this belief that, okay, I'm not really Malayali. I'm not really Indian. And I remember growing up, I would kind of have this hostility towards Malayalis in the sense that I didn't really want to get to know them. I didn't really want to be around them. I didn't like Malayalis. Uh, we would go to... Malayali assemblies uh, sometimes, and I didn't really like being there. I only liked going there if I could hang out with my cousins. Sometimes it makes some friends with, you know, some of the guys here and there. But overall, I didn't like being around there and around them or around the culture. And it wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with Malayalis or with my people. It had everything to do with that comment and because that comment told me I didn't belong to these people. And it, it's, it's silly, but you're a kid, right? And so that's just the messaging you had. And that's just like one example of one of the reasons why I struggled with knowing who I was, right? So when you don't accept that, you're like, okay, I'm not Malayali. And you're growing up, now I'm 15, 16 years old, and I'm in high school. And now I'm also struggling with faith because I'm seeing my dad as this alcoholic who is just drinking all the time and everything else. So I'm also going to church and it's like, what does it all mean uh, to be a Christian? My dad would be sober and go to church and then be drunk and not go to church. And I'd see the way he acted at home. It's like, what does it even mean to be a believer? And I was struggling with that myself. Um, and in the article I mentioned, because a girl in my high school, you know, when I wore this cop's t-shirt that said Christian something uh, on it, and she you know, tapped on my shoulder in class and said, Reggie, you're a Christian. Like she had no idea, it just completely caught her off guard. And that question like hurt me. Uh, and I then had this split identity there where I was like, okay, I guess I'm not really a good Christian or am I a Christian or what does it even mean to be a Christian? Like my dad's this and I'm this. And I, I was starting to see hypocrisy everywhere. And that's kind of what, you know, cognitive dif dissonance is. You can check that out in the article to get a better explanation. Uh, I was really struggling with a sense of who I am. And so that's why, you know, I think uh, I always think of identity being important because at that age and for the next few years, I would always struggle with identity, identity. Who am I? Who am I? And going back to and and. If you were paying attention to me, hopefully I haven't lost you. But uh, going back to this in this story here, like I said, people would say that they were in the crowd. They would be in the crowd. They would identify with the crowd shouting, crucify, crucify him. And I used to feel that way too. But the more I studied this passage, I realized, no, that's not where I would be if I was, you know, represented in this scene. If I was using that kind of application for this passage. And like I said, I, you know, I did the whole theology thing. I just didn't finish the degree. So I understand the difference between what, what a good hermeneutic is and all this stuff. So this isn't like the clear-cut interpretation of the passage. This is just an idea of application. And we're looking at it from a counseling lens. And so when we look at this passage, I think we can see then uh, a picture of who we are supposed to identify with. Um, and so we're not the crowd. We're not the crowd chanting, chanting, crucify him, crucify him, unless you are, you know, watching this for some reason and you are someone who rejects Jesus. 
then you are that crowd, right? Uh, and or if or you could be that person in that crowd if you are someone who's easily manipulated by those who are in power. And this is uh, this is how we bring in the some other actors in the um, in the background, and that's the religious leaders. Uh, the text tells us that they were the ones who incited the crowd into saying crucify him, crucify him, because they were the ones who really wanted Jesus dead, right? The religious leaders at the time. They were the ones that didn't want to see him alive anymore because he was usurping their authority or they were he was showing them up. Everywhere he went, everything he did was showing the people that their uh, their authority and their power was actually, you know, a, a house of cards. It was getting ready to blow over. That God was very clear in sending this prophet, this more than a prophet, this Messiah, and that he had come uh, to do something different to the people of Israel. And so in his messaging and his miracles and everything that he had done and everything he was doing was a threat to their system and to their authority, uh, just like others had done to them as well. Um, the most recent being John the Baptist. And, and they got rid of him too. Right, uh, using John's messaging against against Herod to make sure that Herod got him arrested, and then John just kept speaking the truth, and Herod went ahead and killed him, eventually. Uh, and so now these religious leaders they they had a farce of a trial, which was illegal according to the same law that they were trying to judge Jesus on. They they had this illegal trial, and then they put Jesus on trial, uh, and and they, they found him guilty, which was fake. Also, it was all false. And then they brought him to Pilate. They forced Pilate to put him on trial, but Pilate was, was confused by it all. And so he brought him to in front of a crowd and the crowd had been riled up. And this was a crowd that sided with their power because there's always a group of people or a large group of people. And if you read the Gospel of Matthew, you can see how there was a split. There was a split between people who believed in Jesus as the Messiah or at least believed in him as a great prophet. And it was especially the people who had received his miracles and received his healing and received the good things that he had done for them. And then there were those who, who wanted to just stay with those who were in authority, and probably because they still benefited from their authority. And so you can read that in the Gospel of Matthew, that there was always this split. And so when you get to this portion of Matthew, you can see that it was this part of the crowd that had gathered there and by design, because the it's early in the morning, right? And so the, the the religious leaders had gathered these people and put them there and said, hey, we want you to chant, crucify him, crucify him. And so I guess you could identify with that crowd. If you're the kind of person who goes ahead and listens to those who are in charge all the time and just blindly listens to what they're doing because you like the authority and power that they offer you just by association, by being close to them, right? And, uh, and so that's who they are in this picture. And there are a lot of religious leaders out there today who are still playing this role in society, who side with uh, themselves. They side with power. And how do they do that? Well, they align themselves with secular governments. Uh, and they side themselves with religious power, right? With the religious text. Like for them, they had the Torah. And in, in, in today's uh, in our world, especially in America, we have the Bible. And so we have religious people who side themselves with the Bible. They carry around the Bible. I saw today on Twitter that there's something called the Founders Bible now. And I have no problem, you know, speaking about this kind of stuff. It's it's a new American standard Bible, but it's called the Founders Bible. And in it, you've got articles that, quite frankly, have nothing to do with the faith that Jesus authored and perfected. The articles that they've written and put into the Founders Bible have everything to do with uh, another religion, right, that, that exists in the United States. And so those religious leaders have now their own text, their own Bible that people can buy and read and say, oh, look, this is the Bible and an article that supports what my religious leader wants to do. And so that's how, you know, there's a division that's going to be created. Um, and so maybe you are part of that crowd, right? And you follow the religious leaders and the voices of them that speak and say, hey, when you see the Messiah there, shout out, crucify him, crucify him. We don't want him. So I guess you, some, of, some of you could be identifying with, with the religious leaders. 
maybe some of you are religious leaders uh, in, in youth groups or churches. Um, and the question is, what kind of religious leader are you? Are you the kind that's there uh, inciting the crowd, making sure that you hold on to your power? Or are you the kind that spoke out and did not agree with the judgment that was being made, like we're told about Joseph of Arimathea, who later took down the body of Jesus and prepared him for, and Nicodemus, who took down his body and prepared him for burial and, and put him in his tomb. Um, obviously, there was just this, you know, rolling tsunami that they could not stop. So they just did what they could later on. Uh, and there's always going to be some like those as well. And then you can also see in that scene, uh, Pilate, right? And he represents the secular government. And I mean, you see this guy, he's got the authority there, but he's also afraid of losing that authority. And as well as the religious people, they're, they're, the religious leaders, they're afraid of losing their authority, but they have a little bit more control over what to do with that authority. Pilate at this moment does not want to lose his authority if there's another riot, and he's afraid of that. And this actually happens later in 70 or in 70 AD is when the temple falls, but a few years before that, I think it's about 66 AD, and I'm maybe a little off with my dates here. Uh, it's when the Romans have to come in because there's a big Jewish insurrection. And so that begins the process that leads to the temple destroying and being destroyed, excuse me, in 70 AD. And that's the kind of thing that Pilate was trying to avoid. He doesn't want the the main authorities from Rome or, or some other area coming in and, and stripping him of his power because he can't control the, his, his area and, and stop the people from rioting, which had been a problem before, right? So he sees a crowd saying, crucify him, crucify him. So he's trying to wash his hands and say like, oh, it's not up to me or whatever. And Pilate, and that's just a beautiful picture of what it means to be in, in secular government. You just mostly have people who want to do whatever they can to keep their power. Now, some people go a little nuts and they start to grab power, you know, by the neck and they start to really squeeze too hard and they, they put a lot of people in danger and they hurt a lot of people. And so uh, it's not, a, you know, it's not a perfect antidote in every, every single kind of way. But Pilate is that picture of that politician who is just wanting to please everyone he can in the best way to make sure he doesn't lose his or her power, right? Um, and just kind of I see that. So maybe you're that, but I don't I don't see the sincere believer being Pilate, right? That's an easy one to eliminate. Um, obviously, we're not Jesus himself. And so that leaves uh, one more person to look at, and that's Barabbas or Bar Abbas. Uh, actually, the name should be read Bar Abba. And that name, when you translate it, literally means son of the father. And it's an Aramaic name. And what's really interesting here about the text, especially Matthew's text, the reason why I'm looking at Matthew's text, says Bruce Metzger, which he has a textual commentary uh, and where they go through um, all the, the passages that are in the Greek, uh, him and, let me say they, him and this committee. They always refers to this committee. And they talk about all the problematic portions in, in the Greek uh, manuscript. Uh, where there might be some con controversy, where a word isn't he, or a word says this, or should say that. And if you're not familiar with, with textual criticism, uh, and some people go really you know nuts about this because they want the Bible is infallible and it's perfect and all this stuff, it's inerrant, and they, they just go, they go on about this. But Bruce Metzger explains that in earlier copies, there is evidence that in Matthew chapter 27, uh, the name Barabbas actually originally was written as Yeshua Barabbas. So his name was actually translated to English, English, Jesus, son of father, Yeshua Barabbas. And so what Pilate was actually uh, offering to them was Jesus, the king, right? The one who believes he's the king, Yeshua um, Hamashiach, the anointed one, actually, or Yeshua Barabbas. Yes, Jesus, the son of the father. This is really interesting. And actually most Bibles, if you take your regular English Bible and you go to Matthew chapter 27, you go to that, that portion where he presents Bar Barabbas, you'll probably have a little star and a note that says, or Jesus Barabbas. They'll actually put that in there and say, this could have been there. It's just one of the early church fathers, I believe it's Origen, who thought, oh, this name shouldn't be associated with a murderer a criminal, an insurrectionist, or whatever, right? So 
early church father had the right to decide to take out something that the original writer, Matthew, thought was an important detail to put in. In fact, it's not a, so much as a detail. It is a detail. It's a factual thing. But it's also part of the story that Matthew was trying to tell. If you do a study of the book of Matthew, which I'm now completing with, with uh, some family members, you can see that, that Matthew's gospel is not written in a timeline. Like, this, this is what happened is what happened in order. Matthew's gospel is written as a story, and the story that he's telling culminates in this passage is really important. And what he's telling you is this, that God sees two people, two sons, I should say. He sees his only begotten son, his beloved son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one, and he says he sees Yeshua Barabbas, Jesus, son of father. In other words, he sees two Jesuses. He sees two sons. There's just one divine son and one human son. But they both have the same name. Does that not sound like an important detail, something that we should all know? If it doesn't to you, if you feel like this is nitpicky, I'll explain it to you why. The reason why it's important is because Matthew, again, is telling us a story. He's trying to explain to the reader that when God was watching the scene happen, it looks like a crowd is choosing to crucify Jesus, the Messiah, and that the religious leaders are motivating them to do that. But in reality, the Father above is the one who's choosing between two sons. And he's not choosing which one to crucify. He's choosing which one to save. And the son he chooses to save is the, the one who is not divine, the one who is human. And not only was he a human, but he was also a murderer, an insurrectionist, an all-around bad guy who was supposed to be on that middle cross. The middle cross because he was the leader of everything that had been going on. So he wanted he was supposed to be prominent in this display that was going to be put on by the Romans. The Romans, so many societies have come and gone. The Romans were known to be one of the most cruel societies ever. And the fact that they would use these crucifixions, which I don't believe they invented, but they used them so much more than some of the societies that that were before them. The fact that they would line roads up with people just being crucified, hanging on crosses, and the fact that you would just nail somebody to stakes of wood uh, and have them there alive and suffering and bleeding and breathing and that they, they, they would just hang there so that people can see them um, going through that is pretty brutal. And so they wanted this show of just these three criminals, these two thieves and Barabbas in the middle because he was a murderer, he was an insurrectionist, he went against their government and against, you know, the emperor and everything else. And they wanted to show everybody what it means uh, to you if you do the same thing. You're going to be killed, right? And you're going to be killed in the most horrible way. But it was God who looked at that scene. He said, I choose to save that son, the human one who's guilty of murder, the one who should be hung the one who should be publicly displayed and torn apart and mocked and put to shame and then have his legs broken while, and then suffocate because he can no longer push himself up so he can breathe while hanging on a cross. That's what should have happened. But no, God intervenes and he saves Yeshua Barabbas. And by doing so, he condemns his own son to die. Matthew was telling a story. And so when you look at that story, I don't want to identify as any other person in that story than Yeshua Barabbas. Because he's the one that was shown a tremendous measure of grace. Now, it's hard to verify this fact, and I've looked around, and there's, I think, one little blurb about it that Barabbas was 
later converted into the faith. Uh, but again, like I said, it's very hard to confirm. But whether or not he was, his life was saved at that moment. And it's, it's open-ended. And I think that's, that's, the, that's that way for a reason. Because all of us, all of us can hear the story and hear the gospel and realize that God has saved us. But our end, you know, what happens to us afterwards is, is open-ended. Right? It's not guaranteed that we're going to be rescued and saved and eternally whatever with heaven and God and all that kind of stuff. I say whatever because sometimes the messaging is, is too much about heaven and not, not about what our life is like here on earth. But the point is that our God loves us so much. He loves us so much that even while we are sinners, even while we are sinners, he sees us as his sons. And for, for, for ladies, uh, that's important in, in this cultural dynamic as well, that you see yourself as a son, because what it means is, as a son, you receive everything at, in an inheritance that a man would, right? In Indian culture, this happens too. You know, if a, a, a father dies, like, they don't get all the inheritance, or at least that's how it was when, when my... Uh, grandfather died. Uh, only his three sons received uh, their inheritance. So I don't know if laws have changed since then. This was back, you know, in, a while ago, uh, almost 20 years ago. So I don't know if the laws have changed or not. I, I doubt they have. But in that Jewish culture, it was that way. You know, if a father died, only the sons would get the inheritance. And in this culture, uh, with salvation and inheritance and what it means to be saved and what it means to be part of the kingdom and everything else, it's the same way. They use that language because they wanted to make sure that you ladies would receive the same things, that you understand you receive everything that men do. You are sons too. But yes, you are daughters of the Most High. Okay? You are absolutely His children. We all are. And note that he he sees Bar- Barabbas and he sees him at, when, while he's still a murderer. He has not repented. He has not said he was sorry. He hasn't asked for forgiveness. And that's when he chooses to save him. That's when he chooses to send his son to die on the cross. And that's how he saw all of us. When we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so that's why I've named the podcast. and. Uh, I am Barabbas podcast. That's why I've named it that because that's what I identify as. I am the son of the father. I am the son of the father. I am Barabbas. It's really important to know who, what your identity is. Uh, and I was asked in the Big Brown Army podcast, why is identity so important to me? And I mentioned how I came across you know all those kids that struggle with identity. I had my own struggle with my identity after... Uh, and her name was Helen Witty, and and I, I remember her so fondly, because after she said that, shortly after she said that, she ended up dying tragically in a rollerblading accident, and we were only in the tenth grade. She was so young, and she loved the Lord so much, and so her death, her words, and her death have had so much meaning to me, uh, since that time. But because of what she said, it put me on a journey where it really made me struggle with my faith and my sense of who I am. But once I accepted that I am Barabbas, that I am the son of the father, that I am his beloved, it helped me understand then what my meaning and my purpose is in this world. And let me tell you something. When you know your meaning and purpose in this world, it's easier not to get distracted by those things that are out there that whether it's the enemy or the world or your own flesh, you're going to get distracted by when you don't know your meaning and purpose, okay? When you don't know your meaning and purpose, it's very easy to get distracted by a lot of different things. And the reason why I'm starting out with this conversation, I'm talking about psychology and everything else, is because I believe uh, in existentialism as a powerful tool in counseling. And existentialism is a philosophy that utilizes meaning and purpose to help people with the basic anxiety of death. Okay? They call it basic anxiety of death because not because it's so basic, like 
your basic or you know whatever kids say nowadays uh, i know how it's used i just know how to define it right like you're basic like you're simple i guess uh, but basic meaning it's it's common it's shared everybody has it there are very few people i guess you know there's a percentage of people who don't have anxiety over death but when you have anxiety over death which means at some point all human beings get to the point where they realize death is coming death is looming and it was soren kierkegaard who you know, broke out this this whole image and started this philosophy of existentialism and existentialism got a really bad rap and 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 francis schaefer is a really good author uh and he would make these videos and i don't remember what they were all titled but we used to watch them in in class when i was getting my degrees and they were made in the 70s so they were old but they were they were poignant they were they were you know relevant and everything else still but he was really going out against existentialism because by that time existentialism became a philosophy where you just kind of choose your own meaning and purpose to deal with the anxiety of death but the way the way kierkegaard began his his whole philosophy about meaning and death was actually with a view of god okay and so it started with this book called fear and trembling and in it he's talking about what it would have been like to be abraham walking with his son isaac when his son was just i think about 13 years old and going to the mountain uh mount moriah to sacrifice him and Isaac represented all of his hopes, all of his dreams, all of his promises. I actually just started, you know, studying through the book of Genesis again. And I'm seeing like all the struggles that Abraham had as he was promised by God, hey, you are going to have, you know, so many descendants. I'm going to bless you and bless all the nations of the world, which means all the people groups, all the ethnicities are going to be blessed through you and all that stuff. And, and yet he's not having children. He's getting older and older. And his wife says, hey, you can have Hagar as a wife. And so she gets married and, and he, has, he gets her pregnant. One shot, boom, she's pregnant. You know, good for you. So your problem really is your wife. And so, yeah, then Sarah's all mad and she's, she's all jealous. Like, oh, she's looking at me funny. And they send Hagar away. And, and Abraham's got this big old mess in his head because now he's like, oh, I got a kid, but I can't keep her here. And it's all, it's all crazy. And then finally, some years later, you write that he gets Isaac. Um, and now Isaac's getting older and he's like old enough now, 13. I mean, he's, he's going in and, and that culture. I mean, you're, you're, you're a grown man. Like you're getting ready to get married. Right. And start having babies. Like Abraham's like, this is settled. Now God's like, you're going to, you, I got to sacrifice you. And again, he, Isaac represents all of his hopes and dreams, everything that God has promised him. And he's got to walk towards this mountain and kill all of his hopes and dreams. And that's why Kierkegaard says it's like a perfect picture of what it means for a human being to get to the point they realize, oh, shoot, I'm going to die one day. And it doesn't matter if you're 16 or you're 23 or you're 35 or you're 45 or you're 57 or you're 65. At some point, it hits us. We look forward and we say, oh man, I'm going to die. It can happen at any moment. It's, uh, it's June 27th and just a, a couple days ago, I think it was three days ago, I think it was on Thursday, uh, the a building collapsed here in Miami at Surfside. And a lot of people have been talking about, wow, what would it be like if the building I stay in, the, the home that I stay in every day, that I never think about is going to just fall, all of a sudden just collapsed. It happened at 1.30 in the morning. Every night, almost every night, guaranteed, since I was, you know, at least since I had a baby, since I was like 30, you know, 30, I'm 38 now, so since I was like 33, I've been asleep at 1.30. There's been a handful of nights where I've been awake at 1.30, and it probably wasn't my choice. Can't imagine being woken up by my by the place I'm living at just falling apart. And it makes a lot of people realize if you haven't already, right? I've already thought about it. I've already considered it because I already wrestled with my identity, my meaning, my purpose. But it makes a lot of people realize and struggle with all of a sudden now, especially the closer you are. Proximity matters here. So the closer people are to uh and it's either physical proximity or some kind of emotional proximity or some kind of social proximity, right? So if you 
if you are physically close to Miami and you saw this thing happen or Miami Beach, uh, then you're going to really start and you have never thought about your, your mortality, then it's going to really start to kick in. Just this fear, this anxiety, your meaning, your purpose, what is life for, what am I doing, all that kind of stuff. And that, that's hard to deal with all of a sudden. Uh, and but even if you're in Seattle, right, which is really far away, I've flown there before, such a long flight, thousands of miles away. But if you're if you're in Seattle, but if you see in the news and you see the list of people that are starting to post out that who are missing, and someone in the pictures, they look just look like you, or they look like your mom, right, or they look like your dad, or look at your neighbor, or let's say it's someone who's got the same ethnicity as you are. You're Indian. I know there's like one, one Indian couple that they had a young baby. Indian couple had a Christmas picture that they used to identify like that they're missing. The Patels, I believe their last name is. Uh, there are Indians all over the world who see that like, whoa, that could have been me, right? So they could have been across the world if they just randomly see that like, wow, that could be me over there. Or someone who's planning to come to the U.S. There's a, there was a young lady who just came over from Panama that uh was there who just got there the night before something like that and and she's missing so it's like there's proximity different ways have proximity to these kinds of events and you see it happen or it could be a shooting that happens or it, any kind of sudden tragedy a plane crash and you look at it and you've never thought about death before you could be 16 years old like i said 18 years old you could be 12 years old i didn't really talk about it with my daughter she's 5 cuz i just you know I was thinking about that and is it like necessary to put her through it right now? I decided not to. But the pro just whatever the proximity is, it clicks in all of a sudden into your head. Oh man, I'm going to die. That's what happened when Helen died when we were 16 years old in high school. All of a sudden, I remember that day, there were so many people just crying in our school. People didn't even know her because you realized I'm 16 years old. I can die just because someone hit me in a, when they were driving their car. Right. And that anxiety over death is one of the most intense feelings that people have. And it's really hard for Christians, too, because you've been told what? Well, don't worry about it. You're saved. You're going to heaven. And I know there's some pastors who might hear this message and they're probably thinking the same thing. Brother, it's not that simple. OK, it's really not that simple. It doesn't just take away that anxiety. If people just settle with the fact that, hey, uh, oh yeah, I'm going, I'm going to heaven, so it doesn't matter. It's still, it's still scary to deal with those feelings that I'm going to die. It's still hard to, to swallow that reality. And because we're so separated from this identity uh, as being the son of God, and and being loved by God that much. And the reason why I say that we're really separated from the identity is because we've been taught it from a theological perspective so much. But that theological perspective doesn't connect into our hearts as well as it does from, from a perspective that, that can come from an angle that, that I think shows you how much God matter, how much you matter to God. Right? In other words, uh, if if I just show you in the Bible, and I'm trying to explain to you in terms that's coming out of a textbook or coming out of uh, uh, something that someone's written, like, oh, these are the reasons why you're, you're the son of God. And I'm trying to just explain it to you in theological, scientific, seminary kind of ways. It doesn't take away your doubt always, right? Because there are a lot of people who they hear that message. You're even hearing my message and you're like, but I don't feel it. Or how do I really know? Even as you heard me talk about it, I know that there's people listening it's like, but how do I really know God loves me that much? All I can tell you is, and this is where, you know, I have to rely on the spirit to help is you have to, you have to sometimes just sit back. If, obviously, if you're driving, please don't do this. If you're jogging, right? But take a moment when you can. Get in your bed. Get in a quiet place. 
turn off the phones and turn off the podcast, turn off whatever you got going on, all the noises, close your Bible, put that aside, close your eyes, keep your eyes open, whatever, breathe in and out, and start to pray to your God, your Father. You know how I know uh, my daughter knows that she loves me? Is because when she comes to talk to me, I don't send her away. When she comes to talk to me and, and she comes to sit on my lap. And you know what? It, it gets annoying sometimes the amount of times she says, Abba, will you play with me? Abba, will you play with me? Especially while we're playing. And she says, Abba, will you play with me? I'm like, what are you? We're playing. My wife gets frustrated too because we're literally playing with her. Or sometimes she's the one that gets distracted, right? Like we're playing a game and she's the one that gets distracted by something else. Like she picks up a phone or she sees a tablet or she picks up a toy and she starts playing. So just like, oh, okay, she's busy. So then I, I go and I start to try to do some work or read or something. And then sometimes she, then she's like, Abba, will you play with me? I'm like, I was playing with you. You're the one that walked away from me. You're the one who got busy. You're the one who got distracted. I'm right here. Let's play. That's, that's what it's like with your father in heaven sometimes, isn't it? And I think that if you just take the time to kind of sit quietly, like I said, put away the Bible, because sometimes that's just a distraction too. The Bible just becomes like this thing that's like, oh, you have to hear God, you have to read the Bible. It's like, listen, the Bible is great. The Bible is a great way to, to read the scriptures and see what God has spoken in the past and to see what he's done to learn more about him. But there's a reason why the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. There's a reason why Jesus sent him, why Jesus told the disciples, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm sending someone else to you. And then me and the Father, we're going to both come together and dwell in you. John 14, 23. I'm not going to dwell in a book in some pages. I'm going to dwell in you, right? So if he's dwelling in you, it makes sense that he doesn't need a book to speak to you. Uh, the book helps us to learn about him. But God's not limited by anything. So that's why I say just put the Bible aside for a second and pray. And I'm talking about, okay, God, today I had a good day. Uh, bless me. Whatever your normal prayer is, I'm talking pray in a way that you would with your dad. And, if, and I know I had, a, I had a terrible father, okay? I had a really bad dad, drunk, an alcoholic, a philanderer, a pedophile. He was not a good man, all right? I've had to learn what it means to have a good father by simply looking at my heavenly father. It's why my daughter calls me Abba, because I want her to identify me with him. And that's a really big task I put on myself, and I'm not perfect. So when I mess up, I tell her, hey, baby girl, I'm sorry. Abba messed up. I shouldn't have done that. But she knows what it means to have a good Abba on this world. But I know if, if you struggled with a bad father, uh, that's, a really, that's a real thing that I can relate to. But it doesn't change the fact that he is still a good father. And so you can, you can sit down with him and you can talk to him. And, you know, someone once shared with me this, this vision they had as I was teaching about the same kind of concept during a Bible study. They said that as I was teaching, they had this image of this man who was just super busy. He was working and working, and he was in this room that had a desk, uh, and he had books piled up on the desk, and the room was, uh, you know, just a wall. The walls were just bookshelves everywhere and just filled with books, and he just looked like the busiest man in the world. And then this door cracked open. He's like, where did this door come from, right? Just didn't seem like the kind of room that even had access to it. And in came this little girl. She was real young. And she walked up to the man who looked like, again, the busiest man in the world. And she just kind of tapped on his knee. And he immediately put his pen down that he was working with. And he smiled. And he looked at the little girl and picked her up and put her on his knee. And he played with her. And it was like all of a sudden that work that he was so busy with didn't matter. 
And he said that was his, the image that he got of what it's like to go to your father in heaven. He's not too busy for you. He's not. Okay? And I really, I believe that God will meet with you. He will meet with you. In fact, I pray, Abba, in heaven for anyone who is listening to this, whether it's one or many, I don't know. I don't know what your will is with this work. But I pray, Father, Abba in heaven, that you would pour out your spirit on those listening and that those who are struggling to know that you really love them and that you see them as as your children, that you would meet with them as they sit down and quiet themselves and call out to you for help. I pray, Father God, that you would pour out to them and that you would remove any blockages that are there that the enemy is hovering over, trying to keep them from here, hearing from you, that you would remove them with just a simple flick to get them out of the way. And again, you would flood them with your light and your love and your presence. Amen. And if you want to talk to me directly, hey, let's do it. Uh, you can contact me through the website or on social media, you know, those DMs on, on Instagram or Facebook or, or Twitter are working. Uh, people are, are DMing me through that all the time. And that's why I accept like every friend request, unless you look like obviously look like a, you know, some kind of spammer that's trying to get me into drop shipping. Uh, I've had a couple of people try to get me into that. So uh, it sounds interesting, but I'm not interested. So if you're into that, uh, good for you. Uh, but you can you can DM me on any of those things and just reach out. We can talk. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable talking to me, that's fine. Uh, if you've got like other concerns uh, with with issues that are going on and you want to talk to somebody, I recommend that you reach out to a therapist. Um, I really like Wellspring in in my in Coral, in, uh, in Miami. I was going to say Coral Gables. I think they do have an office in Coral Gables, but their main office is at Old Cutler Presbyterian. But there are other numbers of, of counseling centers in Miami uh, I could give you references to. You could definitely reach out and say, hey, I'd like a reference to someplace. I could get you a reference. If you just you know, give me a general idea of what you're looking for, I could find someone who could help you out. Um, if you've got problems with something I've said, uh, you could certainly share that with me as well. I, won't, I may not uh, always engage because sometimes those engagements don't prove to be uh, productive, but I will never just start off thinking, okay, I'm not, in, I'm not engaging with this person. I'll always try uh, at first. So I'm always interested in that. And so again, you can reach out to me through the website, filethoughts.com. That's T-H-A-Y-I-L thoughts.com. And from there, you can click on the buttons for social media. It's Twitter, uh, at Reggie Thile, uh, Instagram, Reggie J. Thile, um, and, uh, and Facebook might be Reggie Thile or Reggie J. Thile. I can't remember each way, uh, exactly which one. Uh, and again, uh, I just uh, pray and hope that these things will help. And just to kind of summarize uh, the importance of knowing who you are, then sets you up for knowing your meaning and purpose in life. And me knowing that I am the son of the father, uh, I have settled with my meaning and purpose in this world. And my meaning and purpose is to go out and share with others the truth and knowledge of who our God is, for what purpose? Not just for salvation. Salvation is cool. Heaven is cool. But for healing and deep healing so that life in this world leads to the healing and saving of others. And, uh, and so that's what I feel is my meaning and purpose because it's tied to my identity. And so I have no struggle with, with impending death I have no anxiety over that. I don't get depressed anymore. Um, I don't get anxious anymore. It's resolved a lot of issues uh, that I've had in the past. And so I think, uh, and I believe this identity uh, is really important for helping us uh, figure out, you know, things when it comes to politics, when it comes to other things that seem so divisive, you know, denominations and theologies and Presbyterians or Baptists or whatever it might be. Um, none of that stuff matters to me. You know, I, I have ideas, I have thoughts about those kinds of things, but I'm never going to get into arguments or discussions with people that are going to end up 
I would say never because I have in the past and I've learned from that. And I say, you know, I'm not going to do that again because I realize it just causes division in the body. And so I don't want to do that again uh, because it's not in line uh, in alignment with who I am as God's beloved, as his one and only son. And it's another thing uh, that I believe and that each and every one of us can walk around believing that we're his one and only because he's so big. His mind is so big. His arms are so big. Uh, that he can see each of us as his one and only while he sees all of us at the same time. It's kind of cool. Uh, so I hope you're blessed. Um, I enjoyed uh, this time with you, and uh, I encourage you to, to try again to meet with him. I'm sure that he will.